Sabres Live is presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos. Nothing else comes close. We are going to overtime! Sabres Live overtime on location in Montreal this week, and we might be doing this with greater regularity based on the fact that within the confines of a one-hour daily show at noon, although it is going to be three hours on Thursday and Friday of this week, there's an awful lot to dive into, Marty, and it's constantly evolving. So much so that the word was presented to me yesterday in relation to the Sabres and their three picks in the first round. And it was the word temptation. And how much longer can this go on for Kevin Adams before he potentially gives in to temptation and decides to make a deal for one or two or something different, you know, one or two of the first round picks that they possess, yeah. or something different to well, make this club better. How do you how do you view that? You know how trades get done, right? It's not just one person now, like playing on, video games on, and, on, and, on. and are, making are, a trade. Are, are you talking about like Vegas and Anaheim trades, yeah, or in general exactly. how trades get done? So how Vegas and Anaheim do a trade is they make a trade just to have it like canceled out because the player has a no move clause. But I'm just saying, like at times, I think Kevin Adams has. Talk to every general manager and has laid out possible trade scenarios, but you need a willing party to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So do I feel like this year in the 2022 NHL entry draft that we're looking at a lot of movement from the Sabres? I don't think so because I think Kevin Adams is still in the setup where he has his his projected lineup. Mm -hmm. He has his prospect pool and he wants to continue building on that. We're about a year, maybe even two away from saying, okay, the 22nd overall pick in the in the draft, he's a goner. Okay. He's a goner. Like, he's a trade for sure because you either are moving him at the deadline or moving him in the summer to acquire a piece moving forward. So I think we're still a couple of years away, but but it's always interesting to talk about what could be, what players would be available, how you get it done. If he was to, and and we'll use it in quotations, give in to temptation, where do you think he would put his focus right now as far as position specific to try to improve this team via trade? For me, it would be on the defense. And and we talked about a right shot defenseman for a while now because out of their top four defense, when you'd consider power, Yoki, are you Samuelson and Darlene? Mm -hmm. Three of them are left-handed defensemen. So you, you need a right shot defenseman. But... Again, when you are picking at the draft, maybe people are saying, oh, they need to go all in on defensemen, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's not going to fix it next year. Right. It's not going to come into play next year. You're looking at four, five, six years down the road. Mm-hmm. So through free agency or trades, you can plug and play right away mm-hmm. with a certain player. So I think that's where the fixation is. They, they got enough prospect. Enough for, you know, you, you've seen them. You've gone to Rochester many times this year. You know the prospect pool. Forward prospect pool is deep. Mm-hmm. Defense prospect pool, not so much. So, and I think also at the Sabres level, they need that right shot defenseman. So, when you view their depth chart, I like how for, for those that are not watching it on YouTube, that are listening to it, Duffer just flipped the page over to hiding his depth chart from me. No, no, I'm actually showing you now. No, so. but you were hiding it, and now you're <laughs> revealing it. So I have no idea what he put down on his piece of well, paper. Well, the one thing I've learned about working with you is that we have very similar uh, thoughts on things. Marty, when you look at the way the defense corps ended last year, yeah. and you had Dalene playing with Samuelson and power with Yoki Haru, are you comfortable with those two pairings as is going into this season? Uh, yes, I'm very comfortable with those two pairings. I, actually, I'm more than comfortable. I like it. I like the the, the potential there, I like that they're all young, that they played really well together. Now, I know that three out of the four are lefty. So you have Power, Darlene, and Samuelson as left-hand shot, mm-hmm. and then you have Yoki as a right. But I thought Samuelson and Darlene did well to change and the way they right. move together. Um, I, I actually do like Darlene on his offside for the way that he cuts the middle of the ice and he's on his forehand as opposed to cutting the middle and being on his left hand like when he comes from the left to the right. So so there's a lot I like about the way that the uh, season ended with the pairings. Then how would you view the potential third pairing? Okay, so I, I, I feel that Jacob Bryson needs to be given the chance at the start of the season on the third pairing. There was some flashes of, of his skating and his... Um, 
being more comfortable. Now, mm-hmm. there's always moments where I thought he was hesitant. But Don Granado talks about, you know, putting players in position to succeed. And I think Bryson on the third pair would probably be put in that position. Now, the other side, I mean, I love Casey Fitzgerald. Mm-hmm. I think he is He's going to be a stud. He's going to be a leader on the Sabres team. He's going to be a stud. Is he better suited to play another full year in Rochester and continue to gain that confidence? Because Mm -hmm. what we saw to Casey Fitzgerald in Rochester, and you were their duffer, Mm -hmm. you saw it a lot, was a dominant defenseman. At the NHL level, he didn't feel or look as dominant as what we saw in Rochester. So I think that there's a hole there on that third pair with Bryson on the right side Mm -hmm. if you want to give Casey Fitzgerald another year in Rochester to develop. I don't know. Did you see a difference in Casey's game in Rochester than in Buffalo? Uh, No, not a difference. I mean, obviously he was elevated for the playoff run when he came back from Buffalo and, you know, sees more power play time, just for example. It doesn't change the intangibles that Fitzgerald brings, and I see him as a 7-8 with the Sabres, and I don't see him back in Rochester. But it opens the door to have a a true right defenseman come in. Now, obviously we discussed earlier that, you know, the fantasy pickup for me would be Shea Theodore, who's not a true right shot but it's capable of playing both positions. Is there, a, a, like, when you think of right shot defensemen that will be available, presumably, yeah. um, does John Klingberg fit in any way, or is it just not realistic based on contractual demands and inevitably what contracts you'll have to have in place for your young players? I, I think the contract side of John Klingberg doesn't worry me. The part that worries me is that John Klickberg is a top four defenseman in the National Hockey League. Mm-hmm. And are you taking away from Darlene Samuelson Power and Yoki Aryu and what they can achieve? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you'd say, okay, well, taking away from Yoki Aryu is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe Yoki Aryu is better su- suited as a third pair right side defenseman. Klingberg fits into that. But I did like, I, I'll say, I'll say I loved the top four that the Sabres had. Okay. And I think they can go somewhere together. And I think Yoki Aryu, when the trade with Chicago happened, Alex Nylander went to Chicago, Yoki Aryu came over. Everybody that I had talked to said he is a fantastic skater. Mm-hmm. He will be a top top defenseman with any team that he's on. So I don't see him projecting as a third pair. I see him projected as a top two pair. Mm-hmm. So I think Klinberg is interesting. The contract doesn't worry me. Uh, his production over the last couple of years does a little bit because he was passed by some players in in Dallas Mm -hmm. Um, but more importantly I think it just so who's your guy then okay so I have a guy that he's a right shot right defenseman who is a pending uh, RFA Mm -hmm. restricted free agent but has also been given permission to kind of seek a better situation for himself on a team that uh doesn't really have a spot for him. Mm-hmm. That guy's Ethan Bear. And I know that the name is like, okay, he came onto the scene with the Edmonton Oilers, mm-hmm. and he had a really good year yep. as a rookie, and then it's dipped a little bit. But here's a good skater, very good mobile defenseman that can play in almost any situation. I don't think that as a power play guy can kill penalties. Um, I really see Ethan Bear as a potential trade that you can make with a team that, is willing to let him go, that it's not going to cost you a whole lot. He's 25 years old. He's not, you know, out of that range of right. players. He fits exactly into what I think the Sabres would want in, in that third pair right side defenseman. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what materializes on the trade front here over the next few days and whether Buffalo is able to address that position specifically via trade or they just try to, you know, utilize – shall we say, a few or many of their 11 draft picks and and focus on the blue line position. Um, Obviously, all these things are are free-flowing. Kevin Adams addresses the media on this day later on, and uh, you'll be able to see that on our social media channels as well. I would say this, especially based on Chris Johnson joining us on the show earlier on Wednesday, the fact that offer sheets may be more real this offseason just on a changing of the guard, so to speak, among management teams across the league, I would be all for that, and therefore I would go, uh, you know, relatively all in, so to speak, on Sean Dursey in L.A., just because they've been clearly making a yes. splash up front. 
So, you know, may as well put a little pressure on them to uh, perhaps overspend early on a kid that came in and uh, and performed, I thought, quite well. Because I just don't see the more veteran, higher-end free agents coming to Buffalo at this point in time. The Josh Mansons of the world, the Klingbergs of the world. I know. I had Josh Manson lined up, but I'm thinking, again, the same thing. I don't see him don't coming see to Buffalo. And, yeah. and I don't – Kevin Adams has talked about – like I don't know if he used that term, but roadblocking development, mm-hmm. right? And and I think bringing in Manson roadblocks the development of your top four guys. Mm-hmm. I think you're looking at two, three years down the road. Mm-hmm. You're not a Stanley Cup contender next season. Correct. And you're hoping to be with the group that you have moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, look, if, uh, offer sheets are interesting to me mm-hmm. because if you wanted, and this, this is a uh, obviously a uh, – uh, a scenario out there that is very, very hypo- uh, uh, hypothetical. But if you wanted to say Ethan Bear, for example, let's offer Sheetham mm-hmm. because he was making $2 million last year, mm-hmm. right? So the Sabres would have to offer Sheetham at over $2.1 million, mm-hmm. between 2.1 and 4.2 because they don't have that third-round pick Correct. next season. But if they did offer Sheet Ethan Bear, it's a second-round pick. Mm-hmm. Would you make that trade? Of course. You You're could, taking on an established NHLer. Score a second in, round pick. Whereas in most cases, you don't know how long it's going to take a second rounder to come in and develop. And with so, Carolina, if yeah. you were to call him today and says, "Hey, let's make a deal. Mm-hmm. I'm sending you one of my second round pick mm-hmm. for Ethan Bear," mm-hmm. they would probably say yes. You think? Because I don't think they would get more. Uh, unless they really gathered some interest right. from a lot of teams, but no, I think it's good a, way to, good it's way to a, look at it. Yeah. It's making their Ethan Bears like request or mm. possibility to move on, and, and mm. it works for everybody. I think you mentioned the word destination a short time ago. If you didn't, it's just been rattling around in my head. Um, it's interesting reading about the Oilers now after their you know more pronounced playoff run this year that the Oilers can finally become a destination for free agents because of the witnessing by players Dreisaitl and McDavid in the playoffs. And therefore, it starts going through their head. Good chance to win, can take a little less money, great opportunity. We've seen it millions of times. I'm overstating it, but many times over the years in NHL history. So that theory is all based on playoff success, right, and playoff potential. My long-winded question to you is how does Buffalo become in any way, or can't it, become a destination before they ultimately see any form of playoff success? It's hard. It's really hard. And you have to – the NHL is like a spider web of networks. Mm -hmm. And when you have players that in the summertime work out with other players Mm -hmm. and then they talk about, hey, how was it in Buffalo? You guys did good in Buffalo this year. Finished really strong. It was a great year with Rick Jenneret and all of that. And the trade, Dykel got moved and Tuck came in and the young kids in Rochester. And then you start building that momentum. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot more time doing Mm -hmm. it that way. Then all of a sudden you're in a playoff run, you get to the conference finals, and everybody's saying, oh, look at how how a warrior dry sidle was, like playing on one leg, and, yeah. and look at McDavid, and, and lo- look at uh, Darnell Nurse, and look at everybody. And that kind of accelerates the, the destination aspect of your organization. But I do think that the Sabres, like right now, mm-hmm. have players that want to be there. Mm-hmm. They like. There's trade rumors everywhere, you know, and I got it running into somebody yesterday that said, ah, you know, I have a client that's on the Sabres, a young player on the Sabres, and his name has been in the rumors maybe for the brink it, and he, he's, he's worried. He doesn't want to go. He doesn't, like, yeah. that's the feeling that's happening in Buffalo now. Good. Compared to in the past where, mm-hmm. yeah, well, Chicago, great city, great organization. I want to go there. Yeah. No, no. They're like, no, I don't want to go to Chicago. I don't want to be in that trade. Right. I want to stay in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the first step that's to making yeah. that destination. All right, let's play the name game. We can go back and forth oh, if you yes. want, or I can just hammer you with names. Uh, Claude Giroux, where does he go? Claude Giroux. Oh, I think it depends on where Nazem Kadri goes. If Kadri stays in Colorado, there's no room for Claude Giroux. But you think I think that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's going to Kadri. 87 points last year mm-hmm. and could hit a very, very lucrative contract this mm-hmm. summer. 
I don't think it's going to happen. How much would you hate it if he ends up in Boston? (laughs) Well, I mean, if he's in Boston. I'm I'm guessing Leaf fans are going to hate it more. (laughs) Yeah, him and Marchand will get suspended at some point. It'll be fine. No, I actually, I've really gotten to appreciate, and I always liked Kadri the way he Mm -hmm. played. Um, but yeah, yeah, so um, so you threw you threw Giroux at me. I'll throw you a name that I like, and I just want to say: Is it a possibility for the Sabers to maybe go get a Anthony Beauvillier? It is because his name is in the the rumor mill, yeah. and I, I really like him. So I don't know. I am not on the Beauvillier train, and, and it is not. I don't dislike him as a player. I just don't know if I see the need for him in Buffalo. Try to resell me really quick on why he would be a good fit here. I don't know that I can. I just like the guy. <laughs> okay, I, but also I think you're buying a little lower than, uh, yeah, than, than the, the, the the market value maybe would be on the player that. I thought I'd some and, and utility player yes. that play any position, uh-huh. any s- situation, skates fast. But again, I think the Sabres are loaded with forwards and yes. prospect forwards that I agree. You know, we can't even fit them on the depth chart right now, all the players that I think they have. Yeah, that's very true. Where do you think uh, Patrick Hornquist ends up? He's got a limited no move, no trade. I don't think he ends up anywhere. Well, they have to. I mean, they're in tight spot with, they, with Florida. Yeah. They're going to have to. Yeah, but home. also they're going to – uh, Anthony Duclair, I think, he just got yeah, surgery and missed a, the start of the season. Yeah, that's not a that's not a miss an entire season type thing. No, but so. I think they can start and yeah. then do a little bit the the cap gymnastics that Vegas did, where mm-hmm. you are almost hoping somebody gets hurt so you can push them aside and then you can free up some money. So I don't, I don't really, to be honest with you, I don't think there's a lot of interest on the Hornquist. Okay, your reaction when DeSmith resigned in Pittsburgh? Twofold. One. I think that was the right thing for the Pittsburgh Penguins to do. Okay. Um, I was a little disappointed because people are going to say, you are absolutely crazy, Marty. Casey DeSmith is not. He's a 30-year-old backup, right? Mm -hmm. But I've always liked the way that he plays and his structure. I just don't think he's been given uh, the opportunity to – to solidify an NHL spot for for many years, um, not that I thought was a good option for Buffalo, but depth wise, mm-hmm. if you consider, okay, Craig Anderson, Uko Pekalukinen, maybe you don't find that that NHL goalie, but you want a, a borderline three in the organization. Mm-hmm. I thought he would have been a good a good spot, but I I think he did the right thing. How much does Vegas is? current goaltending situation muddy the waters for others as we approach free agency okay vegas may not have robin leonard and laurent boissois at the start of the regular season they got logan thompson which we both are big fans (laughs) of and but they still need some nhl stability in the crease with the vegas golden knights Mm -hmm. or they're going to run into the problem that they ran the last season and that's not where they want to go so Again, remind me why they moved on from Mark Andre Fleury in Vegas. Well, I did see Alan Walsh here earlier today, so perhaps we should ask him. We should ask him because there was a sword in the back of Fleury from Pete DeBoer, right? So anyway, so Vegas in trouble, but there's other teams. I mean, yeah. Chicago, mm-hmm. they don't have a goalie signed. They don't signed. want one. They're playing six skaters Duffer, the whole year. They don't have a goalie signed. I know. They were both <laughs> UFA. They, they, so there's guys that are – I think it's maybe like Chicago's like Buffalo last year. Yeah. We just need to fill. But stay on point here. How much is Vegas muddying the waters? They are going to muddy the water very much, I think. Yeah. You know whose birthday it is today? A guy who fits right in this wheelhouse of our conversation. Ooh. Eric Comrie is 27. No. Okay. So, so here's another So where is he going to end up? I, I, Eric Comrie deserves a shot. Yes, he does. To play more. To than play a what, little more. Yeah. That he, what he has been behind Connor Hellebuck with the Winnipeg Jets. The the Winnipeg Jets have a new coach in Rick Bonus. Mm-hmm. They are going to have a, um, a, 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 I don't want to call it a big year, but Rick Bonus is going to rely on his veterans. And I think Connor Hellebuck is going to play a ton. Mm-hmm. Eric Comrie is going to be sitting playing 15 to 20 games next year. I somebody's got to make a move for Eric Comrie. Again, I don't think that's the Sabers, but maybe it is Vegas, mm-hmm. who they already got Laurent Brossois, who was a Winnipeg backup back in the days, and non-French Winnipeg backup. Non-French, by the way, you're absolutely right. We have to clarify that. Uh, Jonathan Marshall was happy that he was going to have a French teammate. Didn't happen, but 
I I could see Comrie wanting to maybe get a Chicago uh, opportunity, a Vegas opportunity. Boy, that's got to be tough as a goalie who wants an opportunity and then is walking into a, you know, kind of quote-unquote a no-win situation. Chicago is weird to me because – Okay, no win situation. Because it all went wrong but... after bringing in Seth Jones. It, but and I, and still... I don't, I'm not saying it's on Seth. I'm saying that no one could have forecast Flurry, Seth Jones, Jake McCabe. They're rebuilding the D. They've got healthy, healthier Jonathan Taves. Yes. You know, go through the list. Jonathan Debrinket. Brendan uh, Hagel. Uh, uh, like, uh, <laughs> what did I just call him? Jonathan Debrinket. <laughs> Alex Debrinket. <laughs> And, and, You've got Debrinke, who continues his place in the top ten in goal scoring on yeah. an annual basis. Like, I just it has to, and then okay, but then. but if I'm okay, so I'm going to play the the goalie that wants a shot. Yes, I'm 27 years old. Mm-hmm. I'm Eric Comrie. I want a shot. Mm-hmm. They just hired Luke Richardson as their coach mm-hmm. in Chicago. I think the work ethic and the, the culture level. I, I think Luke Richardson is an absolutely. Uh, Great human being. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to really change Chicago, which they need, by the way, with mm-hmm. everything that's happened in the last decade in mm-hmm. the Blackhawks organization. And if you're a goalie and you want to be able to, to get that opportunity, mm-hmm. I would take it. I would take it 100%. Uh, a name you and I personally have not uh, discussed on air is Ilya Mikhaev from Toronto. He is an unrestricted free agent, age 27, 21 goals in 53 games last year. When his name came up this week, it was attached to a rather lofty Ooh. salary figure. But then upon further review, I think, you know what? Maybe that's not unrealistic. Where does he sign and for how much? And is it a tempting possibility for Buffalo or not? I don't see it as a tempting possibility for Buffalo. Okay. I think he did a really good job mm-hmm. in Toronto yep. and was underappreciated, I think, because they had the Matthews and Marner yeah. and Tavares and Nylander and they can kind of play the big stars, but there's always the Zach Hyman, right, that need to make it go. Mikhail mm-hmm. makes it go. When you're talking five and a half, six million a year, yeah, that's a Big, I think big. he'll end up closer to four and a half, but uh, well, you know the agents are going to play the game. They, at this they point. are going to play the game, and there's going to be. I think there's going to be some interest, and yeah. again, it becomes a, a bidding war. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen at twelve oh one on July thirteenth. Correct. It may happen at four o'clock, five o'clock, but there's going to be a bidding war and trying to get closer to the number. I just, again, I don't see the space and the room in the Buffalo lineup mm-hmm. to bring in somebody like that. I, I really think the Sabers, okay. Their forward group, mm-hmm. we could probably list 15 forwards right now mm-hmm. already on the Sabres uh, roster. Yeah, I but mean, there's no reason to keep them all. There's no reason to keep them all, but the ones that you want, you don't trade them. And the ones that maybe you say, hey, there are going to be 14 and 15, well, who, who's going to want them? Right. And no disrespect to Anders Bjork, but... Right, but I think you're logically looking at Buffalo's depth chart right now and recognizing names in the top nine that could easily be moved without, you know... Okay, one much. of them. Well, maybe two of them. Two. Two. I think it's Casey Mills at Victor Olofsson. Correct. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm still putting Olofsson on the different side mm-hmm. because the guy can't score. And last season, mm-hmm. look... We didn't get to go to every practices, but I did go to a couple practices, especially on the weekend, because now with the show, we Mm -hmm. don't. But he just didn't look comfortable shooting. His his injury, his upper body injury, which his arm injury, whatever it was, really delayed uh, and lingered a lot longer. And it affected not only his shooting and his scoring, but his overall confidence in his game. Mm -hmm. And then when... It, it it happens very weirdly, Duffer. It's like a click. Mm-hmm. One day you're still hesitant and something bothers you and you're shooting. The next day, oh, it's gone. Yeah. And wow, now now I now I'm not hitting the goalie in the chest. I'm not missing the net by five feet. Mm-hmm. I'm putting it barring in. And now he's almost surprised. Like Victor was surprised. Oh my God, I scored and I put it in the good spot. Like, and then the confidence build up. Scoring goals is the name of the game. Mm-hmm. Victor does that. So I'm still putting him on a set. Casey Mills, that's a totally different story. Mm-hmm. I think that unless he comes out at a block mm-hmm. or you expect him to come out at a block and have a fantastic season, I think last year the injury affected him big time. Yes. But now you got guys that have passed him by. Mm-hmm. And so 
do I want to give Quinn, Krebs, Paterka, those guys the ice time that maybe was allocated for Casey Millstadt? The answer is yes. Should make for a good battle, though, if they're all there, right? If they're all there. And, and do you see Middlestat staying on this team as a winger or a center? I think it's a wing. Yeah. I think it's on the wing. I don't. I, there's no room for him at center. D- meaning you have Thompson, Cousins, and whom? I, I, Krebs. I like Krebs at center better than Middlestat. Okay. I think you can. Uh, we all know Quinn could probably play the center position. Mm. I, I think Quinn, in my opinion, is going to be a stud a of a winger. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I just don't see Casey pushing the pace at center. Okay. And I thought that when they played him with Krebs, mm-hmm. Krebs was the de facto center, mm-hmm. and Middlestat was on the wing. Yeah. That's that's how Casey had the better success. All right, we'll wind down uh, Sabers Live, the overtime edition, uh, yes. with Sabers Live top fives, five events you've been a part of in Montreal. We'll go back and forth. You don't have to fill all Ooh, five. Ooh, five events? Events. You could have played in or just, you know, kind of casually participated in. Number one on the list. By far, the best time I've ever had in Montreal. Please tell. And it's not one event. It's a a, 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 a daily, weekly kind of uh, chain of events. Oh, that no. was fantastic. So we go back to the spring of 1998. When oh. me yes. and Jean-Luc Grandpierre, who's here, by the way, with yep. the Columbus Blue yep. Jackets yep. Yep. Uh, broadcast team. I have a um, feeling we're going to get to Michael Pekka in this story. Is that right? Well, he was playing for the Sabres, but it was me, Jean-Luc, Denny ML, Eric Rasmussen, Roman Nadur, and Jason Holland. Mm-hmm. Six black aces. Mm-hmm. We came to Montreal in the second round after uh, beating Philly in the first round of the 98 playoffs. And we lived it up. We were a bunch of 20-year-olds, well, 21 maybe, some of the other guys. And every night, mm-hmm. we were out on the town, in the clubs, and mm-hmm. really living it up. And, yes, Michael Pekka has to factor in because he waited until, like, the double, double over, overtime yeah, to yeah. score the goal. Yeah, one of, cut, the, one, one of the great Sabre playoff performances of all yes, time. Yes, but yeah. it cut into our bar time. <laughs> That was game three. It, it also needed... shortened the series, which yeah. ended in a sweep, which ended your time here in Montreal. Exactly. <laughs> well, it, we can blame that on Andy Moog because he couldn't <laughs> stop anything for, for Montreal. And then Jose Theodore went in after yeah. Jocelyn Thibault. It was a mess for Montreal. But Okay, so, so that's good. Best, best time in Montreal was right. the spring of 98. So that's one of our top fives. I'll uh, counter with World Cup 96, game two, a oh. large entourage of uh, colleagues. We were working at the Fan 590 in Toronto at the time. I think it was eight or ten of us, uh, you know, drove down. And, I mean, you you would know most of the guys I was with. It was just an absolutely amazing experience. Yes. It was Molson Center back then. Yes, it was. And uh, it was Mike Richter putting on a show, ultimately propelling the United States into a position to win the World Cup. Who was so. in that for Canada? Was it Curtis Joseph? Probably, and I'm fixated on, on Richter. Richter. He was, he was just so dynamic that Madano, night. So that's two of our five, yeah. Okay. Um, people are going to think Marty's like a, in his booze fest type of mode right it's now. It's Montreal, uh, man. It's Montreal. So w- one night in particular in the 05 06 season, mm-hmm. As both Danny Briere and J.P. Dumont were sidelined with sports hernia, that they had gotten surgery here in Montreal. So we have a trip to Montreal later in the year where they're about ready to come back. Mm-hmm. But they have to revisit the doctor, make sure everything is okay. So they came to Montreal. We came here. We met with one of Danny's good buddy, uh, And we went to dinner. And then we went for a few drinks. And now it's like 1130 midnight. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I got to go home. I, I'm playing tomorrow. But... These guys, like Danny and JP, are are just having a good time, right? So they stayed up. At about 3.30 a.m., JP and Danny walked into my room because me and JP were roommates. And they had the largest poutine for me. (laughs) The 3 a.m., 3.30 poutine. Like they woke up. They turned the lights on. Marty, wake up. There you go. And I had a midnight, like about 3 a.m. poutine with the boys. Went back to bed. We did win the next day. I had to go back to make sure. How did you win the next day? Oh, I was feeling so good. Okay, good. Energized. (laughs) 
a little guilty that uh, maybe uh, you know I wasn't sleeping all right. night, but yeah. uh, oh, feeling so good. Okay, in honor of the new name Sabers Live, I will revert back to August of uh, 2000, seeing one of my favorite 90s bands live here in Montreal. Again, it was Molson Center before it became Bell Center, but uh, definitely lived up to the hype, and um, I absolutely cherish that as one of the concert memories. Of course, we saw. Oh, who's then- the band? Live. Live. Oh. You missed it. It went right over your head. I love live. And I was thinking, <laughs> did he mean the band live? Like lightning crashes it's and never, all of that? Yes, but, that's exactly okay. what I was referring to. It's confusing to. when so, the same word means multiple things. Uh, see that? Live was live. No, it's live live. It's funny. you. If live it's, live. That is, to me, the beauty of the show. If we live live, we're embracing Sabres live, and you're living in the moment, right? Like, don't, So if I said put, Sabres live it would well i'm looking forward to that meaning like they see another day in the playoffs and they live they and they live, live and they live and they live and day. obviously we'll be covering it last okay and, and last the one. fifth one i think this has not happened yet and it will need to happen you and i uh oh will have to come to the formula 1 grand prix of canada in the future yes. and make it our fifth Event, yes. uh, because uh, to be honest with you, I never really spent a lot of time in Montreal. Growing up in Quebec City, mm-hmm. I, okay, maybe g- going to the Expos was a, a yearly thing. We mm-hmm. took the bus from Quebec City, got off in Longueuil, which is on the south side of Montreal, took the subway in, and then at the Olympic Stadium, we'd come and see the Expos. Mm-hmm. That was always a good trip. Mm-hmm. But I think the Formula One would trump that. All right, we will put that on the calendar, but immediately upcoming words from Kevin Adams as he addresses the media in advance of the draft and obviously an awful lot more talk around the league. As we get set for the draft on Thursday and Friday, free agency next week on Wednesday, development camp followed by the three-on-three game, there's an awful lot to dive into and stay connected with as it pertains to the Sabres. Thank you for being with us on Sabres Live Overtime. We'll see you soon. We'll be right back.